Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and it is my pleasure to present Stefano Tonki and Grazia D'Annunzio in conversation about power in fashion. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. And uh, here we are uh, with Stefano Tonki and I'm Grazia D'Annunzio to talk about power of fashion. And uh, I would like to start our conversation with the, the uh, first image of our you know, PDF, that is uh, the one of uh, Melania Trump last uh, August, when the, she wore an Alexander McQueen, a green uh, outfit by Alexander McQueen uh, for her uh, Republican conventional speech. And I think that all of us, when we saw this image, we immediately thought about that the fact that she, it was the perfect image of the power of fashion. And by the way, she was wearing uh, the copy, uh, a copy of a military uniform. So this is my first uh, question to you, Stefano. Uh, could we talk about the power of fashion without talking about the power of uniform? Well, I mean, I think Melania was uh, making a power statement with her McQueen uh, green military jacket, using the power of fashion and the power of uniform. Both of them have a primary function uh, that is to declare, define identity, the real identity of people or the kind of identity they want to project. In the case of Melania, I suppose she want to project uh, the um, image of a powerful woman and for sure the wife of the most powerful man on the planet. So that's really the function of uniform and somehow of fashion too. Um, also, I think that uh, fashion and the uniform also share the idea of the fine, um, someone's place in a community uh, with a very strict hierarchical order. Do you agree? Yes, I totally agree. I mean, the uniform uh, have been, you know, from the antiquity, the, the way, I mean, uh, to identify yourself, to uh, identify your friends and defy your enemies. But at the same time, inside each one of these group, inside each army, inside each community, there is also a ranking that is shown in the uniform. So little details, you know, the, the shape of a jacket or the buttons on a jacket or the colors on the epaulets who kind of also define the position of a member of a, of, of, uh, in the, a member of the same army. It happens something very similar in fashion because uh, clearly even if you are following the same trend and uh, you know kind of visually you may have uh, in your hand the same Louis Vuitton bag one may come from the store and one may come from a street vendor or you know your coat may have a similar shape of the one that is in the windows at Prada but actually comes from Zara or H&M. So there is a, a set of values that uh, I think uniform and fashion somehow share. And, you know, primary really like this idea of uh, identifying you as part of a tribe and uh, making you different from everybody else. Let's move to uh, the picture number two. And that this is a book that you created uh, with, uh, along with um, Francesco Bonami and Maria Luisa Frisa, and that was the book that accompanied the, uh, uh, that was linked to the exhibition uh, aptly um, uh, titled Uniform Order and Disorder that you curated, you co-curated in 2001, and it came to New York's uh, MoMA's PS1. So uh, it was a groundbreaking exhibition, and I would like you to recall a little bit the idea behind putting together a, a, a show like that. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, 
it was uh, a very special exhibition, not because it was the first on uh, uh, uniforms. I mean, I think there have been beautiful exhibition on uh, uniform all over the world. So it was not an historical or costume institute kind of uh, exhibition. It was uh, really centered and focused on the meaning of uh, uniform in contemporary culture and contemporary society. So it was in that sense a multimedia exhibition was a place where we had the real uniforms and people could wear them actually uh, in, the, in the exhibition because they came from different kind of Italian army kind of surplus and play roles somehow. So it was in that sense an experience, experiential exhibition, at least the way it was conceived in Florence. But these uniforms were also shown with the, clothes by designer that were inspired by those military uniform. And also we put all of that in the context of a lot of great images created by, you know, artists, photographers, um, and uh, cinematographer. I mean, there is an incredible history of uh, images from movies. I mean, there is not one actor or one actress that, that in one moment in their career have not been in, milita in military uniforms. So uh, can you tell us when and why fashion did appropriate military uniforms, transforming them into in civil outfits? Well, there has been like an inc a, 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 a kind of a, a, a great kind of uh, exchange uh, of clothes from the military wardrobe to the civilian wardrobe. Sometimes, I mean, it went the other way. Something civilian became a, uh, something military. We will see that more specifically when we talk about uh, uh, coats and trench coats in particular. But the, the, the specific, uh, uh, in the specific, I think, uh, uh, military uniform became a form of civilian uh, clothing when the military uniform were producing mass produced. That happened, you know, in the middle of the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. There were enough uh, fabrics and uh, uh, also the government, the different uh, nation had the needs to feed and dress uh, uh, huge armies. When the war was over, these clothes kind of uh, were there for other uses. So they end up in the civilian wardrobe because there were clothes that had an incredible kind of uh, quality and incredible functionality and uh, something that uh, was always very attractive to uh, designers and, uh, and, 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 and civilian uh, alike. Fashion in particular fell in love with a lot of these items because they were kind of almost like perfect expression of the history of clothing. Okay, we, uh, Stephen and I decided to focus our conversation on women's wear only. And I, in, in this field, uh, the first iconic, uh, the first iconic uh, um, uh, outfit, which moved from a military contest into a civil one, is definitely the trench coat, as you mentioned that before. So, uh, can we, and we can actually move to the uh, next feature. Uh, can we briefly recap the history of this you know, yeah i mean uh, I, um, I think the trench coat or the raincoat uh, more before it became a trench coat it's a, it is a real interesting case study uh, from the research that i did for the book and for and from what we know uh, it was actually a civilian garment created by burberry uh, for the shepherds, something, you know, very uh, protective for uh, people living in the outdoors. So it to be something that would protect from the rain and the cold in the uh, most remote part of England, where the weather was not very friendly. Uh, it was a kind of a, a kind of garment that became very popular with soldiers in the First World War and uh, became kind of, uh, uh, was adopted by the British army uh, and became uh, known as the trench coat uh, because was used in the trenches where the British soldiers were fighting the Germans in France. 
um, after the war, this uh, coat, now, now known as the trench coat, uh, was adopted by civilians, um, women in particular too. I mean, it became like a little bit uh, this uh, uh, garment uh, with a lot of uh, history and symbolic meaning, you know, a little bit like the uh, uniform of spies, uh, the uniform of intellectual. And uh, uh, also, I think after the Second World War, uh, really like almost like uh, uh, took like this kind of transgressive meaning when war by a woman. Uh, and yes, indeed, uh, for, for instance, in the, uh, in the women's wear fashion, a trench became very, very popular right after the Second World War, uh, especially because there was a, a surplus of uh, military uh, clothing. And uh, trench, you mentioned Hollywood, and uh, well, trench was uh, quite popular also in uh, the female story, the female star, the Hollywood female stars, and for instance, and it was ubiquitous because it, you know, it was worn by a femme fatale like, uh, uh, like uh, Marlene Dietrich or a, you know, bombshell like Marilyn Monroe, not to mention the, you know, the glamorous style of the demo that was Audrey Hepburn, and I think that we are all have in our hearts the last scene of uh, Breakfast at Tiffany where Audrey Hepburn kisses uh, John Pepper in a, a lovely trench coat. Uh, and uh, um, I think that the designers also, in the past 40 years, re constantly reinterpreted the, uh, the trench coat. And uh, well, I think for instance of well, Burberry, here we have a Burberry picture, a very recent Burberry picture, and uh, a Burberry trench coat well, is, is a staple in every Burberry collection. And then I, you know, I think of uh, Yves Saint Laurent that in 1970 uh, gave us a very chic and uh, sensual version of, uh, of the trench coat. Why he designed a sexier version of that, a vinyl black trench coat that was worn by his lovely friend uh, Catherine Deneuve in Belle du Jour. And uh, lately we have this Balenciaga 2000, spring 2020 trench coat that is oversized, uh, bigger, you know, the, 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 the exaggerated with these exaggerated shoulders. And uh, it's interesting also to see that this uh, trench coat was part of uh, a collection, a very seminal collection uh, dedicated to uniform. Um, but I think that apart from the um, the cargo, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the trench coat, uh, other outfit, other military outfit, like um, the, um, let's go with the uh, uh, flying jacket, and we have a Ralph Lauren example, or um, a cargo pants, another um, example by Ralph Lauren, not to mention an accessory like um, uh, the backpack that is a military uh, accessory. And we have an example by Prada. Became staples in a women's wardrobe. Uh, why? why? Why that happened, Stephen? Um, I think like a lot of uh, these uh, military clothes and military accessory have a quality that is quite unique. They have... Uh, an incredible uh, design quality. They are in some way, you know, kind of a perfect garment because uh, in them there is the know-how of many, many generations and so much also technical research. You know, there is a great uh, functionality. Think about, you know, the backpack or the parka or the cargo pants. This idea of, of utility. Uh, a certain quality of the fabric, resistant. So there is all this uh, kind of uh, um, history that makes uh, these uh, uh, garment, you know, the cargo pants, the uh, flying jacket, uh, the parka, almost like a, a super uh, u u u uber, u uber items, uber uh, uh, garments, in that prototype of, uh, of design. Also, on top of that functionality, there is also a rhetoric, a, rhetor a rhetoric and symbolic meaning of each one of them that is also so fascinating for uh, fashion designers. Um, 
let's move to the next picture. And uh, okay, let's analyze briefly that um, uh, in contrast with um, functionalism, um, fashion and uh, uniforms also boast a theatrical uh, flair, a theatrical side. So uniform has a theatrical side that of course influences immediately fashion. And we have here, uh, a Celine example of uh, the fall winter 2019, followed by a Michael course of uh, fall winter 2020. But not only capes, also we have uh, uh, for this theatrical size, the, um, uh, the coats with a Paulette, a Bill Blass coat from 1967, uh, the Balmain jacket with the, um, uh, the decoration. So it's a part of uh, this, you know, theatrical size of uniform that fashion immediately appropriated. And also another example of Ralph Lauren. And uh, uh, also uh, we have uh, as a last example, Jean-Paul Gaultier from fall 2009. So uh, what do you think about this, this, this dichotomy, the, the, the function, fun, functionality versus the theatrical, you know, um, I think of uniform? Yeah, I mean, the uniform always serves this uh, kind of, has always had this dualism. On one side, the functionality, the technological aspect of the uniform that has been evolving more and more. And on the other side, you know, the tradition, uh, the need to uh, impress that idea of the theatrical uh, uh, aspect that the uniform kind of embody. I mean, let's don't forget, you know, the Nazi uniforms were designed by costume designer, but from the antiquity, the idea of, uh, part of the idea of, of a uniform was to create something that uh, would impress the enemy and scare the enemy. That's the reason of uh, the helmets and the plumage on top of the helmets and the big kind of epaulets. There were all these elements that had a functionality. Epaulets were created to protect from the sore or like from kind of uh, uh, in, in a fight, but uh, uh, at the end it became more just like a, a, a way to emphasize the shoulders and the power and uh, and that's kind of uh, it's all this symbo symbology that uniforms carry on. Sure. And um, but sometimes the appropriation of uh, military elements uh, instead of uh, the appropriation of military element doesn't follow um, a, you know a kind of. Uh, predictable trajectory and uh, take, the, the, take unexpected twists. And I also th think uh, uh, about it um, of camouflage, for instance. Camouflage, if we think of camouflage, camouflage is the fabric which still now uh, protects the, the soldier and making them invisible uh, to the enemy. And uh, camouflage became, during the, uh, the Vietnam War, from the Vietnam War on, uh, at, you know, uh, at the, the fabric par excellence to show off, instead of conceal, to show off a politically uh, critical attitude, or like, for instance, let's move to the next um, uh, slides, uh, like in this Saint Laurent 1971, uh, to show off a, an unexpected sensual attitude, or, you know, in fashion, another, you know, enfant terrible, um, um, Stephen Sprouse, uh, adopted camouflage for this Debbie Harry, um, uh, this, this uh, outfit worn by Debbie Harry that is a pop, a, 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 a subversive pop spirit uh, kind of outfit because it's definitely um, an appropriation and an homage or an homage to a pop version of camouflage that Andy Warhol did, and it's called Camouflage 409. So that's very interesting, the fact that, you know, some uh, uh, elements uh, are seen in uh, fashion uh, in, a, in a subverted way. And uh, like, for instance, also the logos, 
that we have in fashion, some logos that we have in fashion, like the, uh, the eagle in the Giorgio Armani's uh, logo, right? Or sure, the, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, the West of Orbit. So or, many, uh, so many elements uh, like uh, the uh, camouflage or the uh, golden buttons or the eagles have been uh, used by designer in a transgressive way or any way for sure in a not appropriate way, you know, when you put like uh, the CC of Chanel on the gold bottom, you really make a statement. Uh, when you use uh, the orb and the cross uh, in, of, uh, the Vivian, in the Vivian Westwood logo to uh, on transgressive clothes and t-shirts and uh, uh, things that actually are kind of uh, showing the opposite kind of uh, uh, social and political uh, side uh, of what you know the queen and the royal stand for. They're like subversion of, of symbol. I mean, you said it like uh, the Armani eagle is a very interesting idea of the appropriation of a symbol of power from you know the Roman to the Nazi to the American eagle. Uh, and yeah. suddenly with the letter GA, it becomes just a brand uh, statement. Mm -hmm. And also flags and, um, you know, flags and what flags, you know, stand for, which is patriotism, were totally, you know, reused and reinterpreted in fashion, especially by the punk movement and the queen of punk, like, uh, which is, I mean, who's Vivian Westwood? And here there is a, a, a Union Jack distressed dress that Vivian Westwood did in the 80s and the late 70s, early 80s. And um, uh, Union Jack and also Alexander McQueen uh, appropriated the, uh, the, the, the American flag that he used as a boxer. And uh, he had, you know, he saluted the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the audience after one of his show with his pants down and we yeah. have actually a picture after that but and uh, so it's interesting this uh, and this uh, going uh, again uh, in the um, next picture we also have the uh, the famous you know, Vivian Westwood Mark McLaren t-shirt where the face of Queen Elizabeth is pierced by a safety pin and um, so it was uh, used in a very I mean the queen the 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 the, uh, the, the, the portrait of the queen was used in a very transgressive way. And um, so it also, uh, uh, um, the uh, sim sim symbolism of, uh, of colors in uniforms, like uh, red and, um, and, um, and black, no, sorry, red and blue, or olive and green, play an important role in uniforms and also in fashion, when fashion appropriates them. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there is this, uh, this idea like that, uh, that all the symbolism of the mil in the military world is translated in different ways into the uh, fashion uh, um, imaginary. Um, flags, uh, um, symbols, uh, and colors, absolutely. Uh, the way, you know, the, the red and the blue that stand for patriotism in flags become like something else in fashion. Um, the, the fact that uh, uh, khaki and olive that were colors created to kind of uh, uh, for protection or for or mimetize uh, uh, and make disappear, you know, the, the, the soldiers in the vegetation I use uh, to show off. Um, and then, you know, you, to the fine, to the, to, to, to black, that is this very controversial color. I mean, the color of fashion somehow, but you know, in certain culture, it means morning, morning in other it means just elegance uh, in many, uh, many associate like the, the, the black with, the, especially when it's a black shirt or in a black outfit with the kind of uh, fascist and, and Nazi iconography. But I don't think that fashion is 
pursuing any of these is giving to them actually a transgressive kind of is is using these colors in a transgressive way like when uh, Mucha Prada puts like men and women in a black uh, shirt black nylon shirt uh, it is uh, for sure an act of uh, transgression and not of uh, uh, I would say patriotism or in or kind of endorsement of, uh, yeah, <laughs> of the fascism and uh, yes. uh, um, regime. Mm. And uh, actually we can uh, show here uh, the, uh, the outfit, the infamous uh, Prada outfit of uh, spring summer 1995 that, you know, uh, Stefano was referred to earlier on. And uh, okay, now, we have talked about uh, military uniform and uh, I would like you to analyze the uh, most famous civil uniform, the men's suit, and how it became a staple of uh, the uh, women's wardrobe. So we're gonna start with Mademoiselle Chanel. This is a famous picture by Richard Avedon uh, from the 60s, although we all know that Chanel started her revolution in the 20s. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, the you know the, the the suit has not always been the uniform for men, but it became the uniform of men uh, in the uh, at the end of the of the 18th century and then 19th century, with the disappearing of all the decor of menswear and uh, the, uh, the the new code of the of, of the suit, the dark suit. Um, it was a statement for men and it becomes such for women too, because it's about uh, a, a, a uniform, something that is uh, uh, very useful, egalitarian, gives like uh, uh, a sense of protection. And that's what I think women are kind of uh, uh, from uh, uh, Chanel on uh, try to uh, uh, find uh, in, in, in the men's suit. Uh, Chanel, I, I mean, I'm not a, a historic of fashion, but I think what she uh, was seduced by in men's suit was that uh, idea of comfort, of uh, uh, something that uh, you can you can wear the the, the, the fabrics of men's wear, something that you can move in. So she was looking for uh, to put women in something comfortable. I mean, her kind of uh, suit her like a jacket, um, her cardigan jacket in particular, I think uh, they are part of a, a research of comfort and liberation of women uh, from, you know, the, uh, uh, from, from what they were wearing uh, before. Uh, for- By corset, <laughs> yes, <before>. forever. <laughs> uh, for, for, Saint Laurent and, and okay. uh, designers okay. that came in the 60s. Uh, yes, sorry. I think more like a part of a of a real kind of uh, was part of the, the the moment of women liber the movement for women rights. So they put like uh, a woman in a men's suit in a certain way. So there was this kind of strong appropriation. Uh, you know, the famous uh, tuxedo on a woman. And they also add like a certain kind of transgression in it that was very much part of uh, Mr. Saint Laurent, I think, uh, idea of putting a woman in a men's, in men's clothes. Um, right, in fact, uh, uh, yes, I totally agree with you because um, uh, Saint Laurent tuxedo was put uh, without um, anything underneath on Betty Catrou. And Betty Catrou was very masculine, was actually the alter ego of Saint Laurent. And it was a very uh, androgynous, I would say, more than, better than masculine, very androgynous uh, woman. And uh, so that was the point. I mean, to... that is something uh, I would say different from what uh, Giorgio Armani did like uh, a little bit later when he created really like a, a, a a, a suit for women, a, a, a really like what uh, uh, he did is not put women in a suit, but create a suit for women. That is, is, is a very different concept. 
uh, I think the Armani woman looks for uh, not transgression, but actually for uniformity. She wants to be, you know, like the man, mm -hmm. but in her own skin. So it's a completely different approach. And I think also the way Armani mm, suits are built, are built for women. They are not a man suit on a woman. Um, there is more, I would say, that aspect that uh, uh, Mademoiselle Chanel was looking for, that idea of functionality, of kind of uh, um, comfort, um, almost like of uh, creating a uniform uh, yeah. to work and to uh, be part of the uh, new uh, women power generation, empowering yeah. women in a different way. Yeah, he created mm -hmm. the suit for the career woman, the woman who actually sit in a in a you know in a um, uh, board of uh, and uh, on a board and uh, was exactly like a man had you know powerful uh, in, an interesting uh, position in the um, in the business uh, also yeah. on the business side. I yes. mean, it was a message very silent somehow that was very much in the clothes, was not like. Uh, uh, a, a message of transgression in that sense, but yeah. it was more a, 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 a message of uh, uh, power, but from the inside, not from the outside. And uh, now we're going to jump to uh, the picture number 32 and uh, to the uh, Moschino Stop the Fashion System. And uh, actually, it's interesting what you just said because sometimes also. Uh, the message is not within the cloth, it's not a subliminal message, a, a, you know, a, a whispered message, but is you know, it is, is, is screams on, is on the cloth and it screams loud. And uh, Franco Moschino, our iconoclast uh, uh, designer, late, I mean, uh, back in the, uh, in the, um, in the, um, 80s was one of the few designers who actually used fashion as um, to claim uh, polit um, uh, to claim uh, powerful, ironical, and powerful messages like this one, "Stop the Fashion System," that was printed on his ads and also on the T-shirt. And um, lately, um, even couture brands like um, uh, uh, Chanel and Dior, uh, super famous couture brands, embraced the, um, the idea of fashion as the vehicle of uh, addressing so powerful social and gender messages. And here, for instance, we're gonna move to the Chanel Spring Summer 2015, where the late Karl Lagerfeld stage uh, inside the Grand Palais on this fictional Boulevard Chanel, a, f a feminist demonstration. And uh, in the finale, he also staged a protest with banners in French and, uh, and English. And we can see some picture here and the, and the, the next picture. And um, where you could read um, uh, messages like make fashion not war, boys should get pregnant too, ladies first and he for she. And apart from uh, Chanel, also uh, Maria Grazia Curie's Dior since the 2015 has put feminist above femininity. And we have actually a couple of pictures here of uh, Curie first show, uh, actually Curie's show of 2017 and uh, 2019. So um, do you think, Stefano, it is acceptable to uh, address social and gender messages uh, through clothes that cost hundreds, if not thousands of euros? Um, or is it just you know, a nice way to uh, employ to get uh, more free advertising and become a, an instant, another instant uh, Twitter sensation? I, I mean, I think that clothes um, through the ages have always carried messages uh, 
of uh, social and uh, social and political messages. Somehow they are a mirror of uh, what happened in society, though, so they express those changes, especially messages of gender. I mean, gender equality, I think, is something that has been, uh, I think, uh, one of the missions, I would say, of fashion. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, today we uh, see that uh, kind of uh, uh, printed on t-shirts and uh, becoming really like uh, uh, more important sometimes than the design itself of the clothes. Um, I think it is still very important to see these messages because uh, they're necessary uh, as we see like so many uh, gender rights and racial rights that are in danger and they need to be kind of uh, uh, supported. And uh, I think uh, many designers are feeling like empowered. They feel like they have a responsibility. So they're using that responsibility. So um, do I agree with a, a $500 t-shirt that says everybody should be a fem everybody should be feminist? Um, maybe not with the t-shirt, but yes, with the message. Uh, you don't need to buy the t-shirt, but you can support the message. And the fact that that t-shirt is reproduced, the image of that t-shirt is reproduced all over the world on Instagram, on social media, uh, on advertising campaign, I think it makes it like a very strong statement of the power that fashion and fashion designer have today in society. In the, in the past 50 years, some designers were also able to infuse ethnic uh, minority values in their uh, creation. And uh, Patrick Kelly, next picture, next couple of pictures, Patrick Kelly was uh, uh, definitely the leader of them. And actually, Patrick Kelly was also in your uh, exhibition on uniforms. Do you agree that he was the, the you know, the leader at one of the first, if not the first Well, one? I mean, I, I think that uh, there have been uh, many um, uh, African-American designers and uh, uh, designers of different backgrounds that have uh, endorsed uh, racial minorities, I would say, uh, uh, rights and bringing, you know, in fashion uh, elements of their culture. I mean, fashion is a, uh, has been always like a place where you could show a lot of different uh, cultures and influences. Um, Patrick is for sure one of the first that got a lot of exposure also because he moved to Paris and uh, was showing like, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, on, on, on very important uh, catwalk in a very important moment, bringing that energy of the streets of New York, of the subcultures of New York into like the mainstream. Uh, but, you know, it's something that uh, uh, carries on. I mean, there are like uh, designers uh, that uh, uh, have been working on the African heritage and African history. You know, Duro um, is one of them, Duro uh, uh, Olulu. Mm -hmm. Olulu uh, and uh, Stella Jean in Italy. Uh, yes. Uh, and others that have been more like, uh, I would say, creating a, 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 and, 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 and bringing to, uh, to, to, to the, the world attention, the heritage of uh, uh, African-American uh, in, in, in this country, in the United States. Okay, uh, we're going to move uh, briefly to the picture number 40, and it's Stella Stella Jean. Stella Jean is uh, quite, I mean, it's very dear to me. She is, uh, uh, um, I don't know if she's popular. I think she's quite popular also in this country. She is, uh, uh, she was born in Rome uh, from an 18 mother and uh, a Roman father. And, um, and she's uh, the first and the only uh, um, uh, Afro-Italian, 
uh, Afro-Italian um, designers to sit in our CFDA, in uh, nella nostra Camera della Moda, in Camera Nazionale della Moda. And uh, Stella Jean is famous for um, her colorful printed fabric, like here, and we can actually scroll the other two pictures, also for her multiculturalism that really in, is very root, deeply rooted in her collection. For instance, she went for one a collection, she went to um, South, um, South America and uh, she, uh, she, she fell in love with uh, the, uh, some uh, specific, specific outfits of a small community of Bolivia. And uh, for the, you know, for the spring 2020 collection, she went to, even to Pakistan and she spent three months or, you know, a long time and she became friends of the Pakistani women, a small, in, in this small village, she became friends of these Pakistani women and she, they, and she convinced them to produce for, them, for, for her collection, a meters on meters of fabrics that were embroidery in the, with this um, uh, old and antique technique. So, um, I really like the fact that as she, you know, once claimed, metissage is the gateway, gateway to social development. So Stefano, I like Stella very much, but um, can you tell us, for instance, the difference between um, the multi, you know, the, uh, the, what Stella uh, brings to the audience through her fashion uh, that is different, for instance, from Pierre Moss uh, or Duro? I mean, they all talk about some uh, specific heritage, but I don't think that they are on the same path. They, well, in, uh, they, they in, do something uh, different. I think Stella, like Duro, are more working uh, a part of a group of designers that uh, are really uh, going at the root of, uh, of, of African culture and bringing out a lot of uh, uh, technique and uh, uh, imaginary and and they really focus also on craftsmanship and creating like uh, you know uh, recreating like old technique uh, of prints and uh, a, a great research in on 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 really like the ethnic uh, um, history of 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 uh, of, uh, uh, of blackness uh, on the other side, I think uh, a little bit like what Patrick Kelly started, but it's much more strong with, in the work uh, uh, of Kirby uh, uh, at Pierre Moss. Uh, it's really like a celebration of black culture in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, combining that with a real act, political activism. I mean, uh, Pierre Moss, uh, most famous, uh, uh, I would say, uh, clothes carry a very clear message. You know, you know, in, in 2016, his first show, uh, one of his first show had t-shirt that, you know, already put attention on the treatment of blacks by the police. They have names. That was what, was, what those t-shirts were saying, uh, referring to the people killed by the police in different uh, uh, moments of American history. Uh, most recently, you know, uh, her t his teacher is saying vote or die, exist to resist. So his work is very much about, you know, activism and, 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 and taking part in the change of the world. He believes in that. Mm -hmm. He kind of is saying that uh, his generation wants to change the world, not just dress it. Mm -hmm. And now, again, back after Stella, back to um, Italy, again with uh, Alessandro Michele. Alessandro Michele, uh, since the very beginning, uh, since his first you know, show at Gucci, really uh, revolutionized the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the code of, uh, the aesthetic code of fashion. Not only that, but also, uh, promoting gender fluidity and a different idea of beauty. And uh, here I have prepared, you know, some examples of, uh, for instance, the Gucci advertising by Glenn Luchford for spring and summer 2016, 
followed by another one and uh, the famous Gucci collector uh, Fall and Winter 2018. You don't even understand if the guy or a girl, I mean, if the person on the in the picture is a boy or a girl. And uh, again, uh, we have other uh, photographs of uh, some recent Gucci collection uh, up to the uh, punk musician Daily Miller, that is the, um, and she smiles, uh, and she's the, uh, the spokesperson of the Mascara uh, Lobes Cure, and the, uh, and the famous and controversial Ellie Goldstein in the new Gucci, which is the new Gucci beauty face for the launching of the Mascara Lobes Cure, and of course she has a Down syndrome. So, um, the, the um, it's also, uh, I wanna also stay um, Alessandro Michele because these images are quite strong. And uh, I also want to state that Alessandro Michele, um, I, I also want to say that Alessandro Michele once stated that I love contemporary, but I want all, to always look to the past. You can't ignore it and surely the idea, I, I, and for sure the idea of, uh, uh, um, and, and that, to, to address another idea of beauty uh, is not uh, a novelty in fashion, Stefano. Do you agree? Um, no, I mean, many designers before Alessandro had been dealing with uh, taste and uh, what uh, beauty is and proposing different version of it. Um, what uh, um, Alessandro Michele and the and, and, and the power of Gucci has done is not just to reflect the changes and put like some of the things that society has accepted and bring them in fashion, but also to really uh, be active in this part, in, 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 in bringing these uh, uh, important uh, issues uh, uh, in the conversation. So, what? so yes. Um, so, in other words, uh, you are fashion is part of the uh, is really part of it. Is uh, is part of this uh, active uh, of this activism? I think what is different uh, from the past is that um, you know fashion has always mirrored society and the changes and somehow reflected them, uh, sometimes kind of pushed them. Now fashion want to be an active part of, 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 of change and push for this change in a much more, I would say, uh, direct way. I mean, this is the work of, you know, uh, Kimberly Jean Raymond at Pierre Moss of Alessandro Michele and many other designers. It's not just, uh, about uh, uh, reflecting the reality, but really want, want to change it. And be part of this change. Okay, thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you all for uh, you know, listening to us and goodbye. Thank you, a pleasure having you. Uh, and uh, we are open to answer any questions if you have any. And uh, uh, thank you, Grazia, for your very uh, well-informed introduction. Thank you, Stefano, for everything that you said. Thank you very much. Thank you all.